Senator Roberts has submitted a proposal under Standing Order 75 today. It is shown at item 13 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? Uh, with the concurrence of the Senate, the clerks will set the clock in line with the informal arrangements made by the whips. And I call on Senator Roberts. Thank you. As a servant to the many different people who make up our one Queensland community, One Nation has today advanced a matter of public importance, calling for a royal commission into Australia's COVID response. The rush of real science in the last few months makes it clear COVID-19 has been a tragic and criminal exercise in stakeholder government. The stakeholders milk COVID for their own personal and corporate benefit at the expense of everyday Australians, destroying confidence in their health system. For corporations, the objective was profit in the sale of tests, PPE and fake vaccines that got fake deadly vaccines that government and private mandates maximised. Profit accrued from fast-track TGA approvals that saved pharmaceutical companies billions of dollars and caused a new cost in human suffering, health, human suffering death and injury. Nothing could illustrate this point more than the heartbreaking testimony last week of Deborah Hamilton at the Senate inquiry into Senator Hanson's bill to ban COVID injection mandates. Deborah lost her daughter immediately after her COVID injections, which her employer mandated to keep her job. Her employer and their parent company had Vanguard Investment Fund as a leading shareholder in Financia. Vanguard is the leading corporate shareholder in Pfizer. Vanguard mandated back vaccines they make a profit from. When predatory billionaires and their trillion-dollar investment funds murder a beautiful 22-year-old, vibrant Australian in an unquenchable thirst for profit, it shows corporate ownership and influence has gone too far. For media, the payoff was advertising accepted in return for government's aggressive propaganda-level promotion of the COVID narrative. Mes messaging broadcast to citizens who were captive in their own homes. Academics took their research grants and delivered the outcome they were asked to deliver. So much science in the COVID period was delivered with a high degree of confidence. And yet in recent months, much of the science underpinning our COVID response has been proven to be dodgy, deceitful and dangerous, inhumanly so. Bureaucrats saw the opportunity to spread their power in a way previously never allowed. Bureaucrats who were there to oversee drug companies failed in their duty so badly that malfeasance must be a term of reference for a royal commission. We know the TGA did not check the Pfizer clinical trial data. The TGA took Pfizer's word for the trial results and Pfizer lied repeatedly. When leading international vir virologists analysed the trial data in a peer-reviewed and published paper, they found the Pfizer vaccine caused 14% more harm than it saved and should never have been approved. Finally, our politicians. Australians elected to have nothing but the best interests in their, of their constituents at heart engaged in policy decisions that did more damage to Australians than any foreign enemy has ever achieved. To emphasise why our COVID response cannot be allowed to go without scrutiny, let me review the COVID developments that have come to light in just the last month. One, Ivermectin won the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 2015 and was shown over and over again to be a remarkably effective, safe treatment for early stage COVID and would have saved thousands of lives. Ivermectin was never horse paced. It was an obstacle to drug company profits and our authorities sided with drug companies over the best interests of the people. Two, COVID injections cause eye damage. Stanford University published a study in the journal Nature last month using medical data from 4.5 million people showing retinal vein occlusion, including blindness, significantly increased during the first two weeks after injection and persisted, in the case of Pfizer and Moderna, for two years. Our vaccine approval process was bypassed, smashed. Three, Hamburg and Munich universities' investigation of long COVID using mice and human post-mortem tissue found an accumulation of the spike protein in the skull, marrow and parts of the brain. Months! after the infection or injection, leading to a conclusion that spike protein damages the brain and contributes to long COVID, whether the source is a COVID infection or a vaccine. The TGA has now approved for permanent use Moderna injection, which uses spike protein. What the hell are they doing? Four, COVID injections harm menstrual cycles. A study published last month in the British Medical Journal studied three million women in Sweden and concluded the Pfizer vaccine contributed to a 41% increase in menstrual com complications. This information was first collated in 2020 and was simply ignored when the fake vaccines were approved. Finally, the World Health Organization took time out from promoting child grooming to declare COVID no longer a global health emergency. Now is the time to take stock 
to end all private and government mandates, suspend all hasty approvals and re-examine every fake vaccine and every drug approved using emergency approval. Now is the time to call the Royal Commission Minister Gallagher promised last year. Now is the time to start the painful yet necessary process of taking power from those who misused it and taking liberty from those who manipulated the response for their personal profit. Jail the bastards. Thank we you, want Senator. Justice. Your time has expired. Senator Smith. Uh, yes. Um, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I also rise to speak on the matter of importance raised today by Senator Roberts. Um, all of us in this chamber know that the COVID-19 pandemic caused enormous dislocation, stress, illness and mortality in not just Australia but around the world. It absolutely stretched our health system and our resources to the limit. It asked so much of our talented and committed workforce in the health and aged care sectors. Aged care workers caring for their residents in really, really difficult scenarios. Doctors on COVID wards holding iPads to their patients to say their goodbyes to families and loved ones. And the work of nurses day after day, again, very, very difficult circumstances during a very scary time. And the challenges of this pandemic, of course, have been beyond our health sector. Our teachers, our transport workers and our retail workers showing up day after day in the most difficult of circumstances, risking their personal health and safety and that of their families to keep our country, to keep our health system and to keep our economy moving, including, of course, early educators, who I spoke about in this place many times uh, during the height of the pandemic, who were sent into work each day without PPE, without the necessary supports they needed to provide very hands-on care to some of our most vulnerable citizens as their parents undertook essential work. The pandemic challenged governments around the world to craft effective public health responses. It threw unprecedented challenges to our scientists, to our health system, to, to all who worked to develop the vaccine. It presented extremely difficult circumstances for businesses and touched every part of our economy and every part of our society. And we said before the last election that given this enormous dislocation, stress, illness and mortality involved in this pandemic, of course there will need to be a thorough inquiry. The Prime Minister has indicated that the government will undertake at an appropriate future time an inquiry into Australia's COVID-19 response that will examine the impact of the pandemic and the respective actions of government. That is wholly appropriate. We know, all of us here, that there are serious issues in the response to the pandemic. I raised a number of them myself in this place, including around the preparedness of the aged care workforce, the availability of masks, of PPE. And it is worth noting that across our country, many jurisdictions are already undertaking parliamentary reviews. I note in South Australia just today, another review has been launched into the COVID response and the emergency management response. So there is agreement, and I think there is understanding. I, I think everyone in this chamber agrees that we need to look at the government's response, look at what happened at that time, review that. But the timing also has to be well considered, noting that the pandemic isn't over. COVID is still amongst us. In my community, uh, it is certainly running rife at the moment. We are still in this pandemic. COVID is still with us. And it presents a heightened risk during the winter months, which we are just about to enter. And our focus at this particular point in time, as we enter winter, has to be about continuing to keep Australians safe in a pandemic in which we are still living. We're also doing serious work during this high-risk time to make sure our aged care sector and our aged care workers are supported and that we're minimising outbreaks in these facilities, including through strong infection prevention and control measures, regular reinforcing of advice to address complacency and the provision of a range of support services to this sector. Because we know and have seen over years that the aged care sector is of course particularly vulnerable and particularly vulnerable during the winter months. We're also investing 
$50 million into the research of long COVID. This is an issue which has been raised with me by a number of constituents. I know it led to the recent uh, parliamentary inquiry chaired by Dr Mike Freelander, which made a number of recommendations in its final report on long COVID, informed by over 500 submissions and testimonies from a range of sources. The response to that report is important because there are issues in long COVID too. So, whilst the government agrees that, yes, uh, a review is absolutely and wholly appropriate, the timing of that review is not at this particular point in time, but I think there is absolute you. agreement of its importance. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Acting Madam Deputy Chair. And I'd rise to speak uh, in support of uh, Senator Roberts' motion that uh, we do have a Royal Commission into COVID. It is long overdue. Uh, I will qualify that by saying that if there is a, a Royal Commission into COVID, that all aspects of uh, the COVID uh, management of COVID uh, pandemic uh, is looked at properly. And I say that because when I went to the Queensland Supreme Court and listened to the police case uh, being put forward by the, the, the Queensland police that were uh, stood down because of the mandates, the, the judge there said that he wasn't interested in the biochemistry of the vaccine. And if you're not interested in the biochemistry of the vaccine, the biochemistry of the human body, then I fail to see how you can uh, basically do a proper review of what took place. And in particular, I think the first thing we need to have a very good look at in any uh, Royal Commission is the fact that what was the genomic sequence used in the PCR test, uh, knowing that the virus had 29 proteins of about 1,000 nucleotides each, which part of those nucleotides were actually used in the PCR test to actually determine if you had a positive COVID case. We still don't know what was used in the PCR test uh, in terms of that part of the sequence. Uh, so there's a primer and then there's a probe. What part of that probe was actually used and amplified? 40 times, I might add. You know, the cycle threshold used here in Australia was 40 times. Uh, Anthony Fauci himself said anything over 30 is basically considered dead nucleotides. The TGA themselves said that the PCR test couldn't distinguish between a live and dead virus. So how many uh, people tested positive to COVID that didn't actually have COVID? So we've got to actually do some serious quality assurance here because we spent hundreds of billions of dollars in locking the country down we caused immense harm before we even get to the vaccine rollout. We caused immense harm in the, the overreach, government overreach in locking people out of their homes, locking them out of their states, locking them out of the country. Then when they got in, they were then locked down for weeks at a time, you know, up to two weeks. I'm still getting emails from Queenslanders who've been asked to pay for their uh, hotel accommodation for two weeks, and they can't afford it. I mean, they've got a $10,000 bill uh, because they were locked down against their will for two weeks. We've got to look at why the state government spent hundreds of millions of dollars on these quarantine facilities that were never used. Uh, and I know in Queensland, the, the quarantine facility out at Toowoomba there at Wellcamp has been handed over to the Wagners. You know, these guys don't need any free gifts from the government, I can assure you. Same in Western Australia. You know, $600 billion was spent on rat tests. Okay, all these things did was test for antibodies. I mean, you can have antibodies at any time, day or night, to all sorts of coronaviruses. So, you know, we have to have a serious look at this. I mean, yet again, we have to look at why in the first two weeks after Joe Biden was elected, uh, that three different pharmaceutical companies actually had a vaccine for a coronavirus when, despite the 40 years prior to that, they've never been able to find a vaccine for a coronavirus. And suddenly, after Joe Biden is elected, we've suddenly got pharmaceutical companies who have a vaccine for coronavirus that was supposedly going to stop transmission and infection. And did it stop transmission and infection? No. By the September 2022, we had 10,000 cases or recorded cases of COVID. I know myself and I caught COVID. I didn't bother telling the government. I just stayed home for seven days. But the idea that every time you catch a virus, you go and get a test and ring up the government, uh, you know, that's never taken place before. And are we going to go forward with rules like that? I don't think so. I don't think so. It is not sustainable uh, to live in a society where we are terrifying people about a virus. And I'm not saying there wasn't a virus. I'm sure there was a virus. I'm sure there's a pathogen out there. And by all means, we should protect the vulnerable. But do you go around locking down healthy people, uh, especially those working age population, denying them the right to work, uh, 
and not allowing them to make proper choices, given that the risk of the virus to them was very low. And you know, I personally dispute whether or not the vaccine did stop trans, uh, serious infection. I'd actually argue it possibly enhanced it, uh, given that studies show that there was an increase in IgE4, uh, which was your down-regulating antibody, and there was also an increase in uh, interleukin-10 uh, cytokine. Uh, these are all down-regulating uh, anti uh, uh, proteins in your body designed to stop your immune system from reacting to all this over overexposure to viruses. So I welcome an inquiry, uh, a Royal Commission into COVID, but I would hope that it's uh, done with the best intentions uh, uh, and not with the idea of Senator, being a political hit job. Senator, your time has expired. Senator Steelejohn. Very much, uh, Chair. Disabled people should have always been put first in the planning and response to the pandemic. We should have never seen the kind of delays, the kind of lack of basic understanding about disabled people's needs in emergency health responses that were in fact the reality when COVID broke out. And we must never see them again. There has been plenty of consultation about pandemic response now. Uh, and so from this point forward, there is no excuse that can be found in the halls of government for the failure to centre disabled people in emergency health responses. We know that the Morrison government's response to the pandemic for disabled people was grossly inadequate. The response to the pandemic largely failed to meet the government's obligations under the UNCRPD. The Morrison government failed to roll out the vaccine to disabled people as a priority community and failed to immunise quickly their family members and their workforce uh, that is central to supporting them. The government were too slow to provide PPR, PPE supplies and too slow to provide wraps to the workforce um, and to disabled people, increasing our risk of infection and of transmission. Disabled people and carers were denied the COVID supplement payment that all other vulnerable people received. And that was a measure, in fact, that was supported by both of the major parties in this place. Not to mention that we didn't receive clear, accessible and consistent information. Disabled people were not consulted or included in planning and rollout processes across the board. It took months for an advisory body to be established after the government even started to respond at all. Those in residential uh, accommodation settings were often left isolated, distressed and vulnerable. The Morrison government failed to collect adequate data on disabled people contracting the virus or the deaths associated with the virus. And that is a failure which continues to this day under this government, with the absurd reality uh, that if a person who is disabled contracts COVID-19, uh, but they are not an NDIS participant, which I remind the Senate it's the vast majority of disabled people are not an NDIS participant. If you're a disabled person and you contract or die from COVID and you are not an NDIS participant, that is not reported anywhere as a disabled person having contracted or having died from COVID. Now, we know all this because there have been many reviews and consultations about responses to the pandemic to this point, including hearings of the Royal Commission into violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation of disabled people. There are also current ongoing reviews being undertaken about both uh, the federal and the state and territory government's responses to COVID-19, including their responses in relation specifically to disabled people. In my home state of Western Australia, there is a re review underway right now. So the Greens will be closely monitoring the outcomes and recommendations of these reviews. 
As we are closely monitoring the outcomes and recommendations of the reviews uh, that are looking into detail um, into the impact of things such as long COVID. We will be looking particularly to the Disability Royal Commission for its uh, expected recommendations uh, in its report in September. For these reasons, uh, that's why at this time uh, we will not uh, support this motion. Senator Canavan. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, well, I, I rise to support uh, Senator Roberts' motion, and uh, I hope the government can too, because uh, right now they, the Labor Party are on the verge of breaking another promise they made to the Australian people in regards to having an inquiry into COVID. Uh, I welcome the comments that were made earlier uh, from a senator opposite uh, saying they did still support uh, an inquiry. But uh, we are now almost a year, two weeks away from a year since the election, since Mr Albanese made this promise to the Australian people, and, and people are still desperately waiting for this inquiry. Uh, now, uh, uh, I want to put on record exactly when Mr Albanese made this promise, so it's not just me saying that. On, uh, on uh, January the 25th last year, uh, a few months before the election, uh, uh, Mr Albanese spoke at the National Press Club and uh, a report of that speech in the Australian Financial Review said that when Mr Albanese was asked whether he would have an inquiry into a Royal Commission, I think the question was, into uh, coronavirus, Mr Albanese said, and I quote, it is beyond doubt that you will need an assessment. Uh, he went on to say uh, that uh, whether that would be a Royal Commission or some form of inquiry, inquiry that will need to happen. Now, that promise now was uh, made a year and two months ago, uh, and we haven't heard any detail since. Not, not a single reference around a, a, what would an inquiry look like, would it be a Royal Commission, will it, what will those terms of reference or powers be, will it be able to in, in, uh, inspect the decisions of state governments and state bureaucrats? Nothing. Absolute radio silence uh, from the government until uh, Senator Roberts, and I give him credit for moving his motion, until through this motion we've heard a statement from a government senator saying they do still support an inquiry. Well, where is it now? Where is it? At the time, Mr Albanese did give the excuse that we couldn't have it right now because we're in the heat of the pandemic. This was early last year. Well, clearly we're not in the heat of the pandemic anymore. Uh, all of the restrictions have gone. Uh, no one is, uh, or effectively no one is, is wearing masks anymore. Uh, it is time to have a proper inquiry into what went on. In a few hours' time, we're going to have the government budget delivered, and that budget will show Australia with crushing levels of debt, uh, largely accumulated or significantly accumulated, uh, because of the response to the coronavirus pandemic. Over $300 billion of government spending uh, to support the decisions that were made to lock down, to close borders, uh, to roll out uh, the, a vaccine in record time. All of this spending added up. And the fact that we have now 7 or 8 per cent inflation in Australia is because, a large, largely because of that government expansion, that government spending. And so this has been the largest single level of government expenditure outside of war, and we are still waiting for a proper inquiry into what the hell happened. The other senators have raised the issues of people who have lost loved ones during the pandemic deserve this inquiry. People who have been injured by vaccines deserve this inquiry. People who have suffered through lockdowns deserve this inquiry. But every Australian family is suffering to pay their bills right now deserves this inquiry. Because they are the reason we have this inflation is because of these, I think, somewhat in the end misguided policy responses uh, to this pandemic. You can only hazard a guess that those who are resisting this, those that are playing delaying tactics here to have this, have this inquiry, are a little concerned about what it might find out. A little concerned what it might find out. And they're hoping that perhaps people forget uh, or that uh, people have moved on from their roles and positions by the time this inquiry is announced, and that's not good enough. Uh, we need to have this, this ASAP because the longer it waits, uh, the less institutional and corporate knowledge will exist, remain in, in, uh, in government bureaucracies to actually reveal what the hell happened. 
Uh, we should have had this inquiry announced as soon as the pandemic effectively ended late last year. We've waited long enough. I give credit to Senator Roberts for bringing this. I fully support it. And apparently the government supports it too. We'll stop the talk and just get on with it and announce an inquiry ASAP. It should really be a royal commission. We can have royal commissions into robo-debts, into pink bats, uh, into all of these other types of things. Surely we can have a royal commission to the largest government response uh, in this country outside of war time. People deserve that uh, now. Uh, we've had some Senate inquiries. Last week we had a Senate inquiry into a removing vaccine. We've still got vaccine mandates still in some areas. We've still got those. They should be hauled in first. All well, those should be hauled in first. And I note to the Senate that Pfizer and Moderna have refused to appear at those Senate inquiries. Refused to appear. Now we're pursuing that. We're pursuing that. But that's another reason why we should have a Royal Commission, because all of these companies, all of the government bureaucrats, should be held to account and made Senator, to explain to Australian people expired. what the hell happened. Senator Babbitt. Thank you. Now, the UAP, obviously, we support the establishment of a Royal Commission into our COVID-19 response. We don't just support one, we demand one. It's time. Now, to simply move on from the pandemic as in, as in nothing ever happened, don't worry about it, that's an outrage, an absolute outrage. Maybe an even greater outrage than a multiple multiple outrages perpetrated during the pandemic itself. Now, to not forensically examine how the government and the public institutions handled the COVID crisis would represent an epic failure of curiosity, a dereliction of public duty, and it would heap insult, insult on top of injury to the millions of Australians whose lives were devastated, not only by the virus, by the virus, but more importantly, by the government's response to the virus. Mm -hmm. Now, University of New South Wales Professor of Economics, Gigi Foster, analysed the economic health and societal impact of government-imposed COVID lockdowns and estimated that the cost was 68 times greater than any benefit provided. If she's even half right, we need to investigate that. If it's even partly true, just partly true, decency alone, let alone duty, demands a full and frank inquiry. Now, real world evidence comparing Sweden, Sweden, where lockdowns were not implemented with nations like ours, where government panic was the order of the day showed that Sweden actually did better on every relevant data point. Does anyone here remember what happened in my home state of Victoria? Police enforced curfews, rings of steel around Melbourne, a pregnant woman, a mother, arrested in her home for a Facebook post. Now, to ignore this, to sweep it under the carpet, to insist nothing to see here, that's just disgusting. Disgraceful. That's what that is. It's disgraceful. Now, I could go on and on with more examples and more evidence that the state and the federal governments, first driven by fear, first of all by fear, and then drunk on power, hurt and, and harmed and harmed citizens with their manic COVID response investigation. We need to have one. And that's to say nothing, obviously, of vaccine mandates which threatened free men and women with punitive measures, effectively turning them into second-class citizens, destroying so many livelihoods, breaking up families. If they decline what? A drug that has since proven to be what? I don't know, uh, less than effective, let's put it nicely, less than effective, in some cases dangerous. Worse, worse, now we're seeing the uh, overwhelming evidence of these injuries that were caused by these mandates. Are we not the least bit curious? Do we not care even a little bit? Are we really going to tell Aussies that we're not interested, we're disinterested in finding out any truths? We must investigate. We must learn lessons. We must make sure that these mistakes are never repeated. Now, a Royal Commission into Australia's COVID-19 response is not something that we should just consider. It is something that we should begin at the earliest opportunity. 
the earliest opportunity. It is the least that we can do for the people that we represent. Now, I was uh, elected largely on the issue of lockdowns and vaccine mandates due to the, uh, the heavy-handed nature, the unscientific nature of what the government did, both in my home state of Victoria and obviously around the country as well. And I made a promise to the people that voted for me that I would always push for an investigation. I would uncover the truth. And I'm here today to call on all of you to have an interest in the truth, to say, hey, we're not going to sit back and uh, just push this under the rug. We're going to find out what happened because we want to do better for our constituents. We don't want to be back in this position in the future again one day, especially now that the World Health Organization, Organization has come out and says that they want control over our health policy. Let's not let this happen again. Thank you.